So leadership today is almost as complex as navigating a starship. When I first read this quotation from Michael Genovese, who's a politological scientist, first I had this idea, oh my God, this guy, this guy is right. That's true. Leading people is extremely complex, paradox, contradictory. It's really an art. And actually, my second thought, I started challenging him. And I asked myself, when it was easy to lead people, and I have been leading people for 13 years now, and actually two years ago, I was named as the best female leader in Hungary, an achievement I'm truly proud about. But I still believe that leading people has never been easy. It has always been complex. It's always been very paradox, because we are talking about people. And then I also thought again and started challenging myself again. So why would leadership be different? Why the idea of leadership would change nowadays? And then, then I realized that it's actually because of the theme of this conference. So the theme of this conference is about change and change is never going to be as slow as it is now today. So that's why the idea of leadership and the idea of organizations also have to change. And I truly really believe that it feels like that we live in a science fiction world. And actually, I have two brothers. I'm very proud of them. Both of them are researchers and engineers. One of them works for Ericsson, so some of you might also know him. And the other one works at the Silicon Valley. So when I was a kid, I was really kind of obliged to read science fiction books. And my personal favorite was Asimov. And quite often, it comes to my mind what I read on, in those books. So when we look at the big thinkers, then obviously we are living in an age when Elon Musk is saying that we are going to colonize Mars. And Elon Musk is a guy who is the, was the founder of PayPal, Tesla. Um, and he is also a guy who left, left Stanford University after two days because he said he has most, much more important things to do. He has to address the biggest challenges of humankind. So he is planning to colonize Mars. Or when we talk about Ray Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil is saying that by 2030 we will be able to connect our brains to the internet the way we connect our phone to the internet. So without any device we would be able to access all the information in the globe. And that raises quite many questions. So what's going to happen? How, what knowledge is going to be still relevant, interesting? What's going to be my value as a worker? Quite many questions. And it's going to happen by 2030, so it's a bit more than uh, uh, 10 years time. So Ray Kurzweil is a guy who is one of the best known futurologists whose impact is, is always compared to Edison's impact and he was also named of one of the top 20 thinkers across the globe, also the founder of Singularity University. And you might doubt that this is going to happen or not and I don't think that Ray Kurzweil is definitely right. But he's also the guy who had 108 very famous predictions and 90 of them came true. And one of the most famous one was when we said that before 2000, a machine is going to beat a human being in chess. And in 97, the blue was defeating Kasparov and probably some of you remember that also. So this is happening around us. And when we think about an unimaginable future, the best analogy for me comes from my conversation with Gabor Boyar, who is the founder of Graphisoft Park. And he said that what is, uh, the age that we are living in today is actually not the fourth industrial revolution, but it's more like the third biggest revolution in the history of humankind. And the first biggest revolution happened 40,000 years ago when we invented speaking, because that enabled us to share information with each other. The second biggest revolution happened 7,000 years ago when we invented writing, because that enabled us to accumulate information from generations to generations and to really build a huge knowledge base for our humankind. So the age that we are living in is actually comparable for the, to the times when we invented speaking or writing. But the big difference is that it's not going to happen in the, age of our, in the times of our grandkids or the kids. It's going to happen in our own active years. So this is the surrounding and the first lesson I learned at Singularity University when I was there two years ago on an executive program is that we really have to assume that anything is possible, anything can happen around us. And for that, we need also out of book thinking, but that also puts a huge pressure, a mounting performance pressure on everyone, this type of future. And we also see that society is changing in quite many ways. So we see that democracy is being questioned. So does democracy still work? Or what do we think about education? Is education still meaningful? All these old terminologies and all factors that we are so used to, they do not seem to function correctly anymore. It also puts a huge 
pressure on individuals. Again, if you go back to this unimaginable future, what is going to be my work? What do I have to do if I'm not going to work? Because, for example, robots are going to do my job. How can I stay relevant? How, what are my children going to do? And also puts huge pressure on organizations as well. So organizations' existence is always also questioned. Every day there are new business models coming in, new competitors. The industry structures are not as stable as they used to be. So they always have to think about a completely new way of functioning and being right. So for that, we need the uh, out-of-the-box thinking. And my first question is to you. How many of you feel that you have a special talent for out-of-the-box thinking? Just raise your hands if you feel that you are able to do that. Okay, quite many, quite many hands I see in the air. Uh, but the thing is that we have to realize that we all live in our cognitive prisons. I don't know if you have ever thought about how many tricks your mind, your brain is really playing with you. And your past assumptions and past experiences fully determine how you sense the world around you. There are so many cognitive biases that every year there is a new list coming out. And I don't know if you noticed, but we like to think about ourselves as very rational human beings who make their decisions based on rational thinking, but that's not true. If you read the book of Daniel Kahneman, who's also a Nobel Prize winner, and he says that most of our actions really happen in an autopilot mode. We are still animals, we are still driven by instincts in so many ways, and really our assumptions put huge boundaries around, around us. And I have to go even further and say that our past experiences are underlying hypotheses, which we are not even aware of, because it happens in our subconscious level, they determine how far we can think. And the best example for that, in the past century, in the first half of the century, Doctors thought that it's not possible to run one mile under four minutes. Nobody has ever succeeded to do that. And doctors also said that even if somebody managed to do that, it would be such a big thing for the human body that the, uh, the heart would explode. And there came a guy who was called Roger Bannister, who was breaking this record, and he managed to cross this very magical, very magical boundary uh, in 1940, uh, 1954, and everybody was celebrating Roger Bannister. And he thought that, you know, it's almost like, you know, climbing the Mount Everest or a huge achievement of humankind. But the importance of Roger Bannister was not about his performance, but about the fact that showed that this is something which is possible. And the best proof for that is that do you know for how long his record was standing still after of decades of people not even trying to break it? 46 days. And after that, almost every day his record was breaking again. So, and that's why also I believe that the importance of these rock stars and the big thinkers like Ray Kurzweil, or Peter Diamandis, or Elon Musk, they are so important to really listen to and really follow them on every possible platform because these, they could be also the ones who can show us a completely different system that you can think about what, how the world works. And the best question maybe, and, and I also learned that, that the way we can also imagine that, that if we want to find a real answer, we always have to go back and really change our old paradigms. So whenever we try to find an answer, sometimes we cannot find the right answer because the words do not exist. The right terminology doesn't exist in our current vocabulary. And that's why we cannot think about that. And when we think about the future of organizations or the future of culture or future of people, first we have to go back to a very basic question and ask ourselves why organizations exist. What gives a reason for the existence of organizations? And before you think that this is a rhetorical question, I have to tell you that there is a pretty good answer to this question. Such a good answer that it also deserved the Nobel Prize. And again, asking you maybe who, who has the feeling that he or she knows that Nobel, Nobel Prize winning answer to this question? Somebody in the room? It's very interesting, isn't it such a basic thing that we work in organization and we never question ourselves why we work in organizations, why, what gives the reason for their existence? So actually, the, the answer is coming from Ronald Coase, and you will now say, okay, I knew it, because we, almost all of us learned it at the university, and it is called the theory of transactional cost or the theory of scalable efficiency. So Ronald Coase was saying that we are working on markets, 
and in a market, every trans transaction has a cost. If you want to buy a product, a service, if you want to get talents, everything has a cost. We need to have the information, we need to contract, we need to get into uh, buying it. So when we organize all of these things in a framework of a company or an organization, then we can save on the transactional cost, and that's how we can create scalable efficiency. That's how we can generate profit. But there are two problems with this answer. One problem is that this was born in 1937, in the past century. For 80 years, we take it for granted without knowing what it actually means or do not even remembering, and we still work in this framework, which was built in the past century, and we are still preparing to go to the Mars and we go to the future. And the other problem with this answer is that it was born in a time when we imagined organizations like this. We imagined organizations as neat little boxes where people do their job and they do their job based on the command of their, of their boss. And they follow the reporting lines and they do everything happily. And they are not crossing the lines, they do everything that they, the way they are required and this is how they generate profit. There is also another interesting underlying logic that we unintentionally follow and this is called MECE, created by big consulting companies we says that we have to organize the boxes in a way that they are mutually exclusive, but also collectively exhaustive. Which means that we, when we build these boxes, there shouldn't be any overlap, because that's going to uh, hinder our profitability. But also collectively, it has to cover all the jobs. So we have to be very careful on designing these boxes, making sure that they do not really overlap, but they still create a nice form. But again, I don't know if this is working anymore. And also, if you just look at it, and by intuition, we think about it, is it really the best way to harness humans' potential? Is it the best way for us? Do we like to, put, to be put in boxes? Are we happy to follow the instructions of people without any question? Are we happy to follow the reporting lines? Even just relying on our intuition, we might say this is not the best way how we should work together with people. But there is also actually data which is saying that this old framework and Ronald Cose's transactional uh, cost theory might not be working anymore. And actually I heard it on this particular stage two years ago from John Bunch from Zappos, who said that there is fresh, fresh research which is saying that when an organization doubles its size, it loses 15% of its productivity. So what about then scalable efficiency? If big organizations keep losing, on the other hand, when cities double their size, then the per person GDP is growing by 15%. So there might be something broken here. Maybe this theory, maybe this, our old thinking doesn't work anymore. And also when we think about cities, and I think you know, all of you in the room, you know, you know this type of, you know this type of uh, chart. So when we think about cities, of course cities are more like living ecosystem. They are perfect little living organisms where of course there are some boundaries and there are some limitations, but actually the inhabitants are working together and they make contracts and they fall in love and then they have a coffee together and they build new houses. And that's how it continuously grow when they shape and interact with each other. So this is also how the way we should look at organizations. This is how it should work. And that's why we also have to think about organizations completely differently. So when we say that the old model doesn't work, and we also see that there's something wrong with the data because instead of creating scalable efficiency, we are losing efficiency. Then what could give the new purpose for organization? What would be the new reason that would give a reason for organizations to exist? And actually there is an answer for that too. And that's coming from John Hegel who said that organizations should really forget scalable efficiency. It also doesn't work anymore because when we think about transactional costs, because of the new technologies, the transactional costs are really diverging to zero. Think about if you want to get a new talent. You do not have to do, for example, a job advertisement necessarily. If you need a data scientist, you just go to Kaggle and you create a challenge. And then suddenly hundreds of people are going to work on your challenge. So the transaction costs are really diverging to zero or converging to zero. So that's why he's also saying that scalable efficiency doesn't work anymore. Because the industry structures change so much that we have to really forget about the notion that we understand our customers, then we are going to build the product, and then when we see the product, then we are going to build fantastic processes, and then we train people, and people are going to follow this, uh, those, uh, those commands, and they are going to create profit. That's not going to work anymore, because everything changes so quick. 
And that's why we said that actually he believes that the new reason should be scalable learning. How can we scale learning as we scale profit or as we scale profitability? That's, I think, the next question for most of the organizations, how to do that. And I brought some examples and, um, about organizational culture and uh, how it would work. But before doing that, I wanted to quote some, some other thinking that um, uh, I experienced in the past years. So in the past couple of years, you know, or two years, let's say, when I had a conversation with senior leadership teams and we were talking about strategy, you know, most of them had digital transformation as a key strategic priority. But when we ask the question, so what do you mean actually by digital transformation? The answers become very vague, very high level. Quite often, they are about more like tools that we are going to use and we are going to give iPads to our people, what are the platforms that we are going to use. But it's not real digital transformation. And also because digital transformation is truly impossible without digital culture. And Peter Drucker is still right. Culture can eat strategy for breakfast. If we do not have the right culture and we do not have the right mindset also behind the culture, we are not going to be able to create real digital transformation and we are not be going to be able to create scalable learning also with organizations. So some ideas about the future. This quotation behind me is coming from Tom Friedman. Uh, he's a Pulitzer winning writer, the author of Thank You for Being Late who said that give me a young talent with high passion quotient and high curiosity quotient, and I can assure you that seven days a week, that's going to beat IQ. And I think that's a very strong saying. So that's really saying that when we think about companies, when we think about organizations, again, instead of performance or instead of IQ, we have to shift our focus to passion or to curiosity because that's going to be the winning mindset or the, of the future. But let's stop for a second again and think about it. How many companies have they in their value set that they need, need truly passion? I think so many multinationals, so many big companies saying that, yes, we are all about the passion. But I don't think it's actually true. I think passionate people are pretty dangerous for big multinationals because passionate people really have an idea. They want to make, get it through. They are not going to be, get stopped. They will even get emotional if it's not going to happen. So even if we claim at big organizations that we like passion, I'm not sure that this is the case nowadays, although that's going to be the winning be, uh, behavior of the future. By the way, you are going to see like little comments on the, uh, in that corner, and that's also coming from the World Economic Forum research about the future job skills that are needed. So on organizational level, what this means, that we talk, think about the culture, when we think about the way we structure our organizations, we really have to structure it around passion and curiosity. And obviously, on an individual level, it means that we really have to work on our passion, on our curiosity, and we have to stay open and we have to stay curious about the world is going to bring us because that's going to be a very important winning skill in the future. The second point is about the power of teams. People in HR resources made that mistake in the couple of past years or decades that they put their focus on, the in, on individuals, but that's not going to work anymore. So when we look into the future, we see that the success of the future will depend on the small teams from five to 15 people. And also because there is a very simple rule that it doesn't matter how many smart people you have inside your organization, there's always more outside. So you have to build teams which are really very easily learning and adopting and they change very quickly and they become very solid and very much driving the success of the company. And when I was looking for the best analogy for that, and I was also thinking about, you know, what could be my vision for my own team, how I would imagine my team in the future, then I uh, got, uh, found the, the example of the Navy SEALs. And it was interesting also to, do, uh, to listen to Edward a couple of presentations ago, his experience from the Navy, uh, from, uh, from the Army. And uh, the fascinating thing about the Navy SEAL story for me, that Navy SEALs are multitasking, multi-tools. They are the soldiers who are really trained with spending quite a lot of money because every Navy SEAL training costs approximately 500K dollars per person. So they're ex very expensive tools in the, uh, in the army, but they're really trained to adopt very quickly. There is no 
two same days for Navy SEAL. The organization, the, the environment is always changing. They always have to adopt. Every day is completely different for Navy SEAL. And also they were the ones who were inventing the very famous uh, VUCA word uh, uh, expression, which is about volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous words. So they are really trained to strive in this VUCA word environment. And why we think that when we think about soldiers or Navy SEALs, the first thing that probably comes into our mind is their physical power or the persistence of being extremely very strong. This is not true. The Navy SEALs are selected also by the fact how much they can really work in teams. They are truly looking for people who can almost dissolve in a team, who can belong to the team so much that they almost form a hive mindset they also say that the Navy SEALs, in a way, they have a common um, uh, a subconscious level, which is, I think, very interesting. And also, they have two very important rules when they go for a mission. And one of the rules is that it's always the person making the decision who can make it first. And all the others will follow him without any question. This type of fluid leadership and constantly changing democratic way of organization is extremely interesting because we are talking about really the army, the navy, and they still thought that it works much better in an, adopt, in an environment where we really have to adopt very quickly than, for example, keeping the very old hierarchies. So I think, you know, when I really think about my team, I always have the Navy SEALs in mind. This type of hive mindset, very strong teams, very strong adaptation. This is what I have to strive as a leader to create also in my company. And when it comes to the individual, individual skills or mindset that we need to develop, every one of us, it's about teamwork, connecting to others. It's about leadership. It's about taking the initiative and also the persistence. And I want to stop for at persistence for a while because Nowadays, sometimes I do have a problem with young talent sometimes, and I do miss the persistent part. So I do think that sometimes it's really needed that we truly strive for something on long term, and we do not get distracted by a new challenge or something which is more shiny and easy to get. But we really say that with real persistence, with real grit, I'm going to strive as long as I don't succeed, and I'm going to hold on, and I'm not going to fly from one thing for the other. So definitely, I think if you look at the future workforce, persistence is also a very important par uh, part of the future critical skills. The next example is about adaptability and creative thinking. The question is, what's a cobot? So what's a cobot? Um, actually, there was a conversation with Cathy Engelbert, who is the CEO of Deloitte. And she said that she has two millennial kids. And once his son uh, went to her and, she, and he said, mom, I really think that I'm not going to find a job and I'm very afraid of what I'm going to do in the future. And Cathy said that she started her usual speech about the changing world and the upside potential and then we create our own world and etc. And then his st son stopped her and said that, mom, I think I know the answer. I need to be a cobot. And she said, okay, so what's a cobot? And he said, it's, uh, it's the fact that I need to uh, learn how to coexist with the robot. I think it's a very interesting idea, and it's pretty much about the fact how we are reframing our thinking, how we are reframing the ideas around that, and how much we realize that when we think about the future, and of course when we think about the future, usually if you read the press or the news, on one hand side we always read that everything is going to com collapse and zombie apocalypse is going to be here and robots are going to take jobs and AI is going to kill us all. So that's most of the uh, news. And the other part of the news is, is about the hooray optimism. While actually the reality is somewhere in between and actually the point is that we need to start adult conversations about our future. And we also have to understand what are the analogies. So for example, coexisting with a robot, understanding how it can extend my potential and how we can cooperate to come to something even better than I thought before, I think that's an interest, interesting idea. So also on an organizational level, and also on a personal level, adaptability, critical thinking, that will also help us reframe our, our thinking framework and find new type of analogies for one or the other situation, that's going to be extremely crucial. 
The next one is something which is very obvious. So we were talking about scalable learning. And we know that scalable learning is the most important for organizations. And we also know that lifelong learning is going to be extremely important. But I think the key fact is about it and what makes it really very hard, that it's not just that, that we have to learn something new, that, but the fact that first we have to learn something and maybe it's not going to be valid anymore in three years. So we have to unlearn it. We have to completely almost forget it and have to learn it in a completely different way. And that's, I think, you know, extremely difficult. But also in, as leader or also as human resources person, this is what we have to learn, how to teach people to learn, unlearn, and relearn re re things in this crazy changing world. And also, as a person, what we have to get used to, that we always have to be in a beta mode. And that quotation is coming from, uh, 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 from, from the founder of LinkedIn, who said that we really have to think about ourselves as a product which is never finished. And there is only one four-letter word in Silicon Valley, which is starts with an F, and it's actually not a four-letter four word, and nobody finishes, because as soon as you finish this word, and if, as soon as you feel finished, then it means that you are truly finished. So when we are thinking about our own potential, we always have to think about ourselves as if we were in beta version, always 85% readiness level. Tension is a pretty good thing. I think it's also a very important lesson for me as a leader. We are talking about the fact that we all need to strive for innovation and organizations need to adopt and reinvent themselves and come up with new business models. And for that, we need to work in diverse teams. That seems to be easy. Who in the room thinks that working in a, di in a diverse team is a very easy thing to do, to work in diverse teams? Some of you have already had experience and says that, that it's pretty easy. I think it's actually something that we really strive hard to, to really learn. Because if you imagine a situation that you have a great idea, and I also had these situations in my own life, that you have a great idea, you go into your team, you share this idea and everybody says, you know, wow, this is fantastic. This is truly amazing. Let's get started. Let's get rolling. This is the best idea in the world. And you get started. Unfortunately, that's the best sign that you're not working in a diverse team, that you surrounded yourself as a person, as a leader with people who think exactly like you. And it's much more easy to work with people who think exactly like you because it's so comfortable, it's so easy, everybody's going to agree. You can you know, go much, much quicker, much easier, you can make really great progress. But at the end, the big question is, it good, is it good for the team? Is it good for the organization? And the answer is no. But it's not easy because we are all human beings. So I know from my own personal example as a leader that sometimes I have great ideas. I really go around it. I present it to the team and there is a person who always keeps challenging me. And what I feel that my blood pressure is really going up and I'm becoming very tense. And it's not about the fact that somebody is contradicting me, but it's really about the fact that I really just wanted something great for the team. So the person is just blocking my road. I just cannot move ahead. So, and, and that's a very natural reaction. As a leader, I shouldn't really feel bad about being a human being because I'm a human being. But I have to learn how to live with this tension. Or for example, in a situation like that, try to keep silent and find some time for myself and go back to the situation that I've already digested what's, kept, what's happening around me. And also understand the fact that if we work in diverse teams, that's going to create tension in the organization. But if we teach our people how to handle tension, then we will also see that if there is a problem and tension is going to go up and it's going to create a very uncomfortable feeling in the team, but we all know if we, that if we strive for the same purpose, then it's going to be only a temporary thing. And after a dip, we are going to find a much better solution. So at the end, we are going to re achieve a much better outcome than we thought before. My personal belief is that in Hungary, uh, most of the employees or most of the people, we, are not, we do not really like to manage conflicts. We are not very easy to get into conflicts. So this capability or this ability to work in tension or to understand how I can cooperate with others, I think is something that we really have to learn and something very basic to prepare for the future. And obviously on a personal level, 
it's about communication, it's about social and cultural awareness. And obviously when I'm talking about diversity, I'm not talking about gender gaps, but all the different types of diversity from different history, with different thinking, with, uh, with just completely different mindset for me, that's also part of this diversity. And my personal favorite about the future workforce and the future critical skills is that if we want to strive in the future, then we have to become the most human being. And that's especially true for the leaders. So when we look at the, at the fresh, fresh research, we also see that EQ, emotional intelligence, is really beating IQ. So especially if you look at the leadership skills, emotional intelligence is going to be a lot more important than uh, uh, IQ as we think about it traditionally. And this is also about the fact that in this new type of environment, in this new type of organizations we were talking about, we really have to let command and control go. And we really have to forget it and just make sure that people can truly follow us because of passion, because of purpose, because of the fact that we are sharing the same, same value. But I also have to tell you that this is not easy and it's not easy for most of the leaders to get into this new mindset and they really have to work on it very consciously to make sure that they can let it, uh, let it go. And it's also coming from the fact that the nature of power is changing. So we used to look at power as something which is quite self-understanding, but in this new type of environment, it's not. It's a lot more diffuse, it's a lot more sporadic. So we have to understand that the nature of power has changed quite a lot. And in order to let command and control go and truly ver uh, rely on cooperation, we also need very solid trust towards others and also towards ourselves. I don't think it's a buzzword and it's, I don't think it's just a new hype that all uh, Silicon, uh, leader, uh, Silicon Valley uh, companies are really thinking about self-awareness, how I can really make sure that I understand my toolkit as a leader, how I can really connect to other, others, how I leave myself times, time to refresh my energy, also how to take some rest. Because as leaders, we really have to become the most human being also in the company. But also, if you look at the World Economic Forum predictions, by 2020, in the top 10 most sought after skills, we also saw emotional intelligence for every single person. And the last um, story that I wanted to share with you and the last thought that I wanted to share with you today is um, even if you are thinking about a science fiction world and even if the things that we live in, we can really live in a virtual world, in the age of virtual reality, augmented reality, we can truly create a completely virtual world around us. And actually, it's very easy to find also facts that are corresponding and underlining our ideas about this virtual world that we are creating uh, for ourselves. But I also feel that in this era, we are so hungry for something real. And I remember when I was last time in the Silicon Valley this August, and I had uh, the opportunity to meet Ray Kurzweil or Peter Diamandis, I was really thinking who was the person who had the biggest impact on me. And actually, it wasn't the big rock stars, one of the big rock stars on this huge stage, and 2,000 people are really watching them, and their group is following them. Uh, but it was a, a small breakfast where I had the chance to meet Clayton Christensen, who is the author of The Innovator's Dilemma, and he's also the university of, uh, well, he's also the professor of Harvard University. And Clayton is almost 70 years old, and he came to the stage, and he could barely walk, so he had a stick and he couldn't look into the eyes of the audience. He also shared with us the story that he had stroke a couple of years ago and he will never recover fully. And he was talking about his theories, the word, and also his life. And he said that he finds that the biggest problem with organizations, why they are losing and why they cannot really invest in innovation, is the fact that they are so focused on the high-end profit that they always forget the bottom line. So big organizations always look for this quick profit, uh, the best idea, how we can create the biggest margin, but that also kills innovation and their long-term success. And the big problem is that we do the same thing in our lives too. So we really strive for a fantastic startup that really hits in and grows exponentially and it's going to create you know, huge money, or a quick project work or some career uh, progression so we look for this very quick, very speedy impulses. 
And then we go home and our partner forgot to wash up the dishes or our children are being naughty and we do not get that same kind of quick impulse or quick appreciation as we do in our work. So Clayton Christensen was asking the audience, what is your strategic intention in your life? What do you optimize for? Do you optimize for this high end profit in your life? Or do you also optimize for the bottom line? And he was also asking what really matters. And I remember there was complete silence in the room. And that really made me think how hungry we are for something that truly matters. And when I think about it, what truly matters for me, then I always remember uh, that famous research coming from the Harvard University, where they were following uh, the lives of more than 200 people, actually almost 300, and that was the biggest longitudinal research in, uh, about happiness. So what they did, they really followed these people throughout their lives and they went to them and had interviews with them. They also measured their uh, finances and their success and they also talked to their friends and their spouses and it was a huge research and one of the persons who was participating in the research became uh, the president of the US but there were also guys who became alcoholists or they completely lost their track in life. And after this huge research which was really done for 75 years, the key conclusion that came up that it's not the success, it's not about the money, it's not about IQ that determines our happiness, our life, but it's our relationships. The very interesting thing that after all this big research, we came to the conclusion which was always in front of our eyes. And I think it's so much true. It has all been always here and this is what really matters. So even if we think that we live in a science fiction world and even if we think that everything is very quick and we have to continuously learn and we have to speed up everything and we always have to strive for a high-end profit or a new success, I think the biggest advice is that we really have to be very human and we really have to get, drop back into our bodies, in our minds, in our communities, into our relationships because that really the matters most. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. I think we've got some questions here. Get them up on the screen. Maybe. All right. So this one got voted up quite a bit. Uh, I was talking about you, you mentioned not focusing on the individuals, but rather the team. And a yeah. question about how do you motivate the individual within that context? Uh, I think it is still, of course, obviously still the individual is still there and we have to understand you know, what the individual motivation is all about. And when we think about uh, the next trends, it's everything is going to be customized. So it can be also different case by case and we also have to understand the different needs of every single person. So I think in a most, you know, in an optimal future, when we talk about HR, we do not try to stereotype people and we put them in boxes, but really find the, uh, the kind of connection to each and single individual to find the right motivation. And I think also the, mo the concept of motivation is changing because it's not, uh, so also people really have to watch out for each other and teams have to motivate themselves and really, they really have to create purposeful connections within the teams and it's everybody's responsibility. Great. Uh, this next one is, uh, you mentioned EQ beating IQ uh, in, the, in the workplace. Uh, yeah. how, how do you go about measuring EQ? Uh, so there are also tests that we can use to measure emotional intelligence. I also do it uh, myself, so from time to time I measure it. And I think the best thing is always to have conversations with people. So I think those type of feedback that you can get from somebody who really wants to build you and still can give you the honest feedback, I think that's definitely the best feedback that you can get. But also I think that the great tests really help a lot, so there are tests for that. Okay. <laughs> Which is your favorite Asimov novel? Uh, yeah, that's easy actually. <laughs> it's, um, in Hungarian it's the Mezi Telenop, so I think in English it's the Naked Sun, and it's playing on the uh, planet Solaria, and it's about the fact that uh, there's this planet where are 20,000 people living uh, with 200 uh, million robots. So the people do not have to work anymore because robots do their jobs, and all they have to do is to really think and do some arts, and, um, and they do not really 
uh, live to work or work to live, but they do something more, something different. And of course it has a big prize, but I think it's a very interesting thing. And the reason why it really comes into my mind, because when I was reading that book and I was really a kid, somehow it really, uh, I really remembered it for a long time, and I didn't think that that can be an imaginable uh, version of our future. But today I think that that can be also a version of our future, and that raises a very interesting question. And maybe not in my lifetime, <laughs> but, uh, but later on it will. Sounds like a fun future. Um, okay. Um, so this question, uh, the, the asker shares that EQ matters, but how do you explain why revolutional, uh, revolutionary leaders are not uh, that strong emotionally? Yeah. And there, there are quite a few in history that are, and are uh, you know, the bull leader. Yes, I, I think you know, that's definitely true. So we also need the rebel type of leaders. So the ones who really question everything and they really go ahead and they have this very, very crazy ideas and really changing the world. And that's true, that's very much needed, but we also have to realize that they are very hard to follow because it can create such a big distance with people, so they also have to surround themselves with leaders who can really translate their mission, their crazy ideas to their teams. So everybody is thinking about Steve Jobs, for example, but everybody knows that he was the crazy one, but there are also <laughs> rumors and quite many stories that he was really very hard to work with. So I believe that also with other, without, without other leaders, he wouldn't have managed. But of course, with such a fantastic mind, you know, it's easy to admire him, but by itself, I think it's not enough. Yeah, you have to wonder if Jobs, for instance, knew that and, yeah. and very intentionally surrounded him with people that complemented yes. his skills, that sort of thing. Uh, let's do one more. Why do you think having answers are better than having questions? Yeah, actually, that's a good question because I, I don't believe that. Oh, okay. I really don't. <laughs> uh, um, a couple of years ago when I started researching the future of work and I, I read a lot about it, I remember that... Um, I read a, 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 a huge piece of research from M, uh, MIT Sloan Institute, 70 pages, you know, huge research, a very interesting one. And in the foreword, it, the foreword it said uh, that um, actually in this report, we do not have any answers, uh, but at least we are raising the right question. Uh, and that's actually, I think, very much true. Because if you think about the future, we do not have one single set of questions. We have to learn how to predict the future differently and the scope of uncertainty is growing. So modeling and understanding the different scenarios of the future is very interesting, but I think it's even more important to ask the right questions because we are not going to have the answers for sure. So that's not true, but I think we cannot avoid constantly thinking and challenging ourselves for different scenarios, at least in our mindset. So I don't think that there is one single answer. I very much believe in it, at least posing the right question. That can already help a lot. And for example, one, one of my favorite right question for any type of organization. It's about sacred cows. So what are the sacred cows within the organization? Those underlying assumptions, the product that we never dare to touch, the value that we take so much for given that nobody dares to question it. In case of Kodak, this was one of, one of their values, was their sacred cow, cow, which was about quality. And this is something that killed the organization at the end. So what are the sacred cows? What are the things that are so sacred nobody dares to question them? But there is also a time when we have to ask ourselves, is it maybe time to kill our sacred cow? And Steve Jobs was a, a very famous sacred cow slayer who never hesitated for a second to look at his own products and kill one product from one day to other because he knew that if he doesn't do it, then the competition will. So I think for me, that's one of the best questions. What is my personal sacred cow that I have to think about and I have to uh, maybe consider getting rid of it? And the same is true for organizations. All right, thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. And uh, we've got a little gift for you here. <laughs> thank you.